and play changes the entire dialogue of Saturday's game. Also, yes, Aiden Childs is still the guy and will be the guy the rest of the season. And plus, a little bit of Michigan State basketball talk. Let's go. You are Locked On Spartans, your daily podcast on the Michigan State Spartans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Just visit FanDuel.com to get started. Spartan friends, Spartan family, Locked On Spartans listeners, thank you all so much tuning in to Locked On Spartans. Your team in green and white five days a week. Please rate, review, subscribe. Comment below on YouTube your positive outlook from Saturday's game. Yes, I know it was a loss. I, there was a lot of rain clouds, both literally and metaphorically in that game. But what did you like from that game? Comment below on YouTube or if you ever want to reach out, locked on Spartans at gmail.com. That's probably the busiest that inbox has been after a game. Got a ton of emails. We'll get to a few of them in segment two. And then segment three, well, we're going to talk about basketball. That's right, a sport that we've neglected here the last few days. But I also want to thank you guys for being patient for this episode. Uh, this was supposed to drop earlier on Tuesday. But, guys, I apologize. I had a family golf outing in the last two days, driving across the state each way. And that's actually where we're going to start right there is driving across the state, Sunday morning, I, I had a lot of time with my own thoughts after that game. And like any sane, well-adjusted adult, I, I spent the bulk of that two-and-a-half-hour drive well, yeah, thinking about the game that was played by college kids the night before. So one thing that I just kept getting hung up on, and it's it's just funny how it works, or maybe it's actually not funny at all, um, is that one play really changes the whole tone of the game. And we're not even talking about, hey, okay, if, if Nathan Carter catches that ball in the end zone, Michigan State's 4-0. We're all happy. No, no, it, it also changes the conversation, the dialogue, the temperature, whatever you want to call it, around your quarterback, Aiden Childs, okay? Nathan Carter, let's say he catches that ball in the end zone late in the fourth quarter, about four-ish minutes left. Well, yeah, our Spartans are up a touchdown, okay? And instead of talking about Aiden Childs and how turnover-prone he is, how rough of a second half that was, how inaccurate of throws he was making, we're talking about his brilliance as an improviser. Okay, that was a broken play from the start. Guided Carter out there to the left. Had him throw a block. Okay, you know what? We're going to lock this ball in the end zone. And yes, it hit Carter in the hands. Probably should have been caught. Michigan State takes a seven-point lead. And yeah, instead of talking about three interceptions, well, Childs only would have had two interceptions at that point because he wouldn't have to throw the third one, which was still a bad decision. But man, it's just one little play like that can... Change the taste in everyone's mouth. Isn't that just funny how football works? Now, I will say this about the Carter catch. I mean, it's far from a guaranteed play. I mean, just because the ball hits you in the hands doesn't mean it's an easy play. I can't imagine at practice they work on that a lot of, hey, Carter, you're actually going to come out, you're going to block, and then you're going to shed that block. And I'm going to throw you a ball in the rain over your shoulder. You have no idea where any defender is, and you got to come down with that. I don't think that's a play they often practice. So, yes, should have caught it. I understand why he didn't, but, yeah, still frustrating that. That was the difference between a win and a loss. Now, what I'm not trying to do is, you know, just be a full publicist for Aiden Childs and trying to erase the entire history of that game or give you a peek through some alternative universe where every single play works perfectly. Like, no, there, there still were about three or four more interceptions that Boston College could have had, some thrown directly to them. One was thrown in the middle of two guys so perfectly or imperfectly. Well, if you remember the play, they collided into one another and they absolutely exploded each other. So they didn't intercept the ball. But and of course, the missed overthrows like it was far from a perfect game. Should that last play have gone down well on that drive? I, so there is still, of course, things to work on here. But man, just one play away from a different tone after that game. I do want to focus on the positives, though. OK, like I think that we've done a really good job. I'm thinking of all the negative things in the last few games, right? Like, that was a very irritating game. I'm not saying that, you know, you shouldn't be upset with that game, that Michigan State, actually, you can make an argument, is 4-0 because they did beat someone on Saturday. Unfortunately, they just beat themselves. But, yeah, I mean, we, we've sulked on it for long enough. I want to just still focus on Aiden Childs here because a lot of heat has been on him, again, rightfully so. But I'm going to point out some things that explain why he is – Still going to be the guy moving forward here. I know that there is a good faction of the fan base that is losing patience with him very quickly. Bad throws, overthrows. But let's point out some things that not a lot of other quarterbacks, not just in East Lansing, not just in the Big Ten, but around the country can do. Like, let's talk about that first touchdown drive for Michigan State. Who remembers the third and ten? 
He was dead to rights twice in his own backfield. He, he scatters, he scrambles, he makes a guy miss between the sticks, and then bang, right there, first down. That grows into a touchdown drive, okay? Guys, I know Tommy Schuster's a fine backup quarterback, okay? Had a fine FCS career out there in North Dakota. I know there are some people that are saying, let's plug him in right now, start playing him. Well, he is a fine quarterback. I'll tell you what, Schuster's not going to get out of that sack. Schuster's not going to scramble his way to a first down and eventually score a touchdown on that drive. And that wasn't the only example of, you know, Aiden Childs being great with his pocket awareness and also being able to extend plays. I mean, after his first interception of the game, you're thinking to yourself, all right, well, how's he going to bounce back? It was that late in the first half field goal drive. During that drive, guys, he was dead to rights in the backfield two separate times, was able to spin around out of the sack, extend the drive. I Look, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to Tommy Schuster. I mean, I'm trying to tell you what the average quarterback would have done there. They would have gotten blown up for a sack, and that would have killed the drive completely. Aiden Childs, yes, he is flawed right now, early on in his career. But it is also massively impressive, too, in four games in his career, that he has the wherewithal in the pocket, okay? Out of 11 pressures, only sacked once, and... That one, I, I don't know if there's any quarterback in college football that could have gotten out of that one. But, guys, it, he is also growing in front of us. The growing pains are still there. And we also talked in the postgame Saturday. Some of these overthrows aren't even growing pains. They're just bad throws. There is some of that in his game. But let's also focus on what we are watching here. We're watching the growth of a quarterback, and you can see it just like that. You're not going to get that out of your backup quarterback no matter who it is, no matter if it's MSU's backup quarterback or go around the country, I it, look, this is only going to work. This whole rebuild, and I'm going to sound like a broken record from after Saturday's game, this rebuild of Michigan State football in the first two or three years under Jonathan Smith is only going to work with Childs as your quarterback. Schuster, not only is he already at his ceiling as a player, guys, he's going to be gone at the end of this year. He doesn't have any eligibility left. Let Childs grow these last eight games of the season on top of what he's already learned the first four games. And that's going to vault you into 2025 season where, yeah, you're ideally going to want to go eight and four, nine and three to show that you are growing as a program. But growth only works if your prized high ceiling quarterback well, can grow from his mistakes. Uh, so don't sell your stock. I mean, again, like I'm not trying to just be Mr. Eight and Childs PR guy here, but I. I think the panic is a little too much. We said that we would trust the process. There is going to be some growing pains. And as someone that likes things instantaneous over here on my end, like, yeah, like we are still four games into the season, two of those being road games. He was asked to do a lot in this last game, throwing 40 passes in the rain, missing his top three receivers. You don't have a run game. Just, I, 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 I know that everyone's starting to lose the patience that we're asking for, but you got to just be a little more patient. I'm not going to completely call him a bust or say that you need to throw him in the trash can just after four games. Let's see how things look by the end of October at the end of this very, very tough gauntlet. And then give him November too. My goodness gracious, guys. Uh, so again, not a perfect start at all. It's not guaranteed to turn around, but... Like, we're not in the middle of Child's second season as a starter here. Like, we are going to let this play out. At least I am, and I encourage you to do it as well, just for your own mental sanity out there. You drive yourself crazy if you really get hung up this early in a kid's career. I can't believe I'm trying to be the voice of reason right now. It's what a far way we've come here. Um, and so, again, just going back to, like, the one play. And, and you could also pick and choose other one plays. You could also pick a play that Child's missed, like that wide open pass to Foster. You know what? You're just one good play away from winning that game. And... Unfortunately, it, it negates what an awesome performance that defense had to. I just want to shine a little bit of light on them. They've been strong through the first now four games of the season. I can't put any blame on the defense for that game last week. They held so strong right after the K. Ron Lynch Adams fumble. They held so strong in fourth and goal at the one yard line. I, they just did a fantastic job. They turned Thomas Castellanos into nobody, really, guys. It, it was amazing. I, I think he had old, what, four scramble yards? That's only three weeks after Cam Fancher had 60-some scrambled yards and ate you alive. But, yes, on the edge, Jalen Thompson, really strong game from him. Chris Bogle continues to have a really strong season. I, the linebacking core of Wayne Matthews and Jordan Hall, I, they shined. And Pro Football Focus agrees, too. They were the highest graders on the defensive side of the ball, both grading over five. But uh, that just – now I'm getting upset again. Because it sucks that Jordan Hall's stand at fourth and goal at the one, largely uh, – Meaningless outside of a highlight that you could put at your end of the year banquet, I guess, but still in a losing effort. And once again, held Castellanos to just four scramble yards. That is so tough. And man, 
We also don't really get to celebrate the kicking properly, too. Four, four field goals, 51-yard field goal in the driving rain, too, from Jonathan Kim. And then Ryan Eckley, two punts, total of 98 yards. I, I, those are just great performances. It's just the little things, which unfortunately have become big things here for Michigan State in the world of turning the ball over. All right, guys, we're going to be back here in a hot second. We're going to talk some mailbag questions because, again, you guys loaded the inbox. Thank you very much. But first, you need to talk your ears off about five-hour energy. Guys, again, I was at a golf outing over the weekend, and, man, when you're playing 36 holes, 36 holes, well, what tastes great after that to keep you going through the night? Well, some five-hour energy. We had a full night of euchre ahead of us, and, yeah, if it wasn't for five-hour energy – that would have been a 9 p.m. bedtime for your good friend Matt over here. But no, no, no. We went over to 5-Hour Energy. We're talking zero sugar. It's convenient, portable size. You can throw it right in your golf bag or your glove compartment or what have you. It is a perfect pick-me-up for getting stuff done. And the 5-Hour Energy website has flavors galore, guys. We are talking watermelon, tropical burst, grape, berry, and more. There is a flavor for everyone, so try them all. On the site, you even have the option to build your own 12 pack or 24 pack you choose the flavors and it is delivered right to your door so stock up for the rest of tailgating season over at fivehourenergy.com and if you go to fivehourenergy.com that is the number fivehourenergy.com and get some five hour energy product today you can use my promo code locked on cfb to receive 20 percent off your order this offer is only valid until september 30th on one order and cannot be used with other promotions the code is not good on subscription orders so go to fivehourenergy.com today all right once again the mailbag locked on spartans at gmail.com just like so many of you guys did after the game some very down on the team which i i get it very emotional loss. Like, that's how we started the post-game show, right? Like, it never did I think that starting the season three and one would feel like just such a bummer right now. But it was well within their grasp. And again, MSU, you could say, moved to 4-0 because they did a really good job of beating themselves on Saturday. Urgh. Anyway, so... We're going to continue the conversation, the Charles R. Schuster uh, conversation with this email. This is from Brody. It's a little lengthy, but he brings up a lot of good points and also other points that I've heard from many other tweets, emailers too. So this encapsul encapsulates everything pretty well. Brody writes in, what I am here to ask is what more do we need to see or not see from Charles for him to be benched and Schuster comes in? I mean, quite frankly, Charles is just not performing well enough to start at a competitive Big Ten level. He's just simply not looking at the numbers. He has a 54 complete completion rate, seven interceptions, and a mere four touchdowns. I am honestly quite sick of hearing that quote. He's 19 years old. Give him some time. I completely agree. I was not expecting him to even be a top quarterback in the Big Ten, but certainly with the way he has been playing, he is a bottom half uh, quarterback in the Big Ten. So here's what I think. We have given him a lot of patience and have not overreacted when he makes mistakes, but watching this game, his mistakes cost us the whole win. Therefore, I think he needs to be benched, and let's see what Schuster can do because we can't have a quarterback who is going to lose us games. Uh, again, guys, like I, it's very clear now that I am pro Childs. I am pro give him some more time, more than just four games in a season. And again, some of those overthrows, like, inexcusable like the, the one to foster like that's really bad but may, may i interest you in this argument right here is that michigan state was also in that game largely because of aiden childs okay i got he was asked to throw the ball 40 times in that game rainstorm all right and i don't think that was jonathan smith brian lindgren being lazy not ever checking the weather forecast and saying to themselves well we only had one plan coming in and Damn it, we're going to do it anyway because that is just what we had written up in the game plan. Like, no, the reason that they're having him air the ball out 40 times is because you don't really have a run game you can rely on. Yet again, between the tackles, you got 3.5 yards per carry. Just not good. And you know what? There's a stat here that I jotted down. This is courtesy of Pro Football Focus. They do yards after contact stats. This you don't see a lot. Michigan State, they had Michigan State running the ball at 4.3 yards per carry. Guys, they had 4.7 yards after contact. That means for a lot of the game, they were getting contact behind the line of scrimmage. This has been an ongoing story since the Florida Atlantic game. So they put a lot on Aiden Child's uh, shoulders. We also got another email, too. This is from our guy, Matt C., who wrote, you know, from Drew Stanton, Brian Hoyer, Kirk Cousins, Andrew Maxwell, Connor Cook, Brian Lewerke, and Peyton Thorne. Their touchdown and interceptions rates, okay, as first-year starters. This goes from Drew Stanton with 22 touchdowns, 12 interceptions. Ends with Peyton Thorne, 27 touchdowns, 10 interceptions. All right, right now, as Matt C. pointed out, 
Childs is on pace for 21 interceptions. That would shatter the school record that is at 16 right now. But do you know what all those quarterbacks had? The seven that we just listed, by and large, they had running games they could at least rely on. There is a lot on Aiden Childs. And again, I'll bring it up because it's not nothing, the fact that he was missing three of his top five receivers in that game. So I I know that we have said let's give him patience, but it's just four games into a season under some unfortunate circumstances here. So I'm going to keep on hammering this point home. And this might be where we really start to disagree on things. But I, I think, because remember, this is a marathon. I'm not just talking about the season. I'm not, I'm not talking about child. I'm talking about the rebuild of Michigan State football. It's going to take two or three years. You're hoping that Childs is your quarterback for those two or three years. He's the guy with the highest ceiling that Michigan State can realistically get. So where we might be disagreeing on things and what might sound Looney Tunes on my end is that I think a five and seven season where Childs learns under 12 games is more important to this program than a six and six record with him on the bench for eight games and then Schuster, you know, playing quarterback. And by the way, just because you play Schuster, that isn't guaranteeing six and six either. Like, Childs gave you probably the best shot to win that game on Saturday. I don't think Schuster's spinning out of those sacks. I don't think he's pushing the ball downfield as much as Childs can. Again, this is all hypothetical. We could each have our arguments why that's right or wrong. What I think is correct is that you need Childs to learn for eight more full games, get a full season under his belt, because really your takeoff point as a rebuild is year two, 2025. You get him 12 games of experience of lessons, showing what he can do, honing the things that he's already doing well. This isn't a total dud across the board, guys. You can see the zip on his ball. You can see the pocket presence. You can see his legs. Let it all materialize over just, you know, four games of the season. So what I, I'll answer the question. Well, what do I have to see for me to bench trials and start Schuster? Jeez, like 20 interceptions by November. I, and I know I'm giving him an incredibly long leash there, probably longer than, you know, I actually really think, but no, it, it would have to just be single-handedly losing us the Iowa game and Michigan game too, before I even think about Schuster for the last month, where you're going to have to steal three games if you don't win a game in October. So I, guys, I, I think these are very important live lessons you can learn during these games. Now, Brian writes in, do you think the reason why us Michigan State fans are so upset besides losing a very winnable game is that we want to be respected like how we were during the Mark D'Antonio days up there with Ohio State, Clemson, Oregon, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, I, we, you you got to walk before you run. Like You got to prove that you can beat those teams like the Maryland's, which you already have, like the Boston College's, which you almost did. So Look, there's 17 reasons to be miffed about that game on Saturday. I'm sure, you know what, we're, we're all begging for the days of being as good as we were back in the mid-2010s. And yeah, it, it is a bummer that you lose a lot of the juice with this weekend's game, 4-0 Michigan State versus 3-0 Ohio State. But my, my biggest bummer actually does have something to do with Ohio State and Oregon. It's the fact that well, those are the next two teams on your schedule. If you lose the game, you're 3-1 and one, leaving Boston College, and then up ahead you got... We'll call it Iowa and Purdue next. Like, okay, a game you're probably going to lose, but you're going to be competitive in. And then a game you could definitely win. You can see four and two pretty easily. Well, I, I don't see it in the next two weeks, guys. Uh, again, like I, I don't want to be, you know, Johnny Raincloud over here. You're going to be 24-point underdogs this week, and I think it's going to be a similar spread at Oregon. I know it happened. I know we beat Michigan that one time as 24-point underdogs uh, during the COVID year, but I just – I think you get to do that like once every 10 years. So Michigan State burnt up their card on that one side. Yeah, Ray Ray writes in a three-pack of questions, as he quite often does. Ray Ray asks uh, great questions always. Matt, point blank, how are you going to record podcasts this month? Five-hour energy drinks with a little help? Rough sailing for a while. So he's talking, you know what? It's going to be a tough four-pack of games coming up. Fire State, Oregon, bye week, Iowa, Michigan. Th this could be a tough stretch for MSU. To which I answer, Ray Ray. I watched every single game last year. You watched every single game last year. If we can make it through last year and still get up and talk about this team five days a week and you guys to listen to this uh, show for five days a week, if we could do last year, we could do this next month. Come on, we got this, guys. All right, the question number two, is it your gut feeling that Aiden Childs will cut down on the interceptions? Is his inevitable growth just a media talking point, or is it likely? As an MSU fan, I'm scared because – there have been quarterbacks who didn't progress like we thought they would. Now, what Aiden Childs has is that we didn't really see out of any other quarterback early in their career is just the canvas we have to work with, with the physical tools he has, the big arm, the legs, the combination of it all. 
each interception almost has its own different story. Some of that was just miscommunication on route. Some of that was just poor decision-making, like the one that ended the game on Saturday. I mean, or just, uh, just outright bad throws. So it'll never be a, a, a great thing in Charles's game. I have a feeling, but can he mitigate the damage to where it's just, you know, one interception per game? Yeah, I, I do, because I think a lot of these two are young mistakes, like forcing the ball into a ridiculous spot when you don't need to, like that game-winning drive last week. So I think it will get tapered off. How quick? Well, yeah, your guess is as good as mine. We're going to get to his third question, and then another, uh, just a nice listener uh, email, too, and then a little bit of basketball talk here at the end. But first, guys, need to talk your ears off about... FanDuel Sportsbook, America's number one sportsbook. They have hooked it up all football season, guys, whether it's NFL, college, you name it. They have the props for you, the futures, the same game parlays, which I'm a huge fan of, of course. And uh, <laughs> actually won a same game parlay, unfortunately, on Saturday. I had Foster over 50 yards. I had Valiant over 20 yards. I had Aiden Childs over 200 passing yards. And the reason I made that sound is because I also had Boston College money line. If I got to see Michigan State lose a game, I want to be compensated for it. And I was courtesy of FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Speaking of compensating, hey, NFL fans, you could start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get in a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play by play, and so much more on the same page where you can place your bets. And you will get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. When you place your first $5 bet. Again, guys, $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet on FanDuel. Head over to FanDuel.com. Again, guys, that is FanDuel.com, America's number one sports book. The third question from Mr. Ray Ray is, well, he wants to know if we can start cloning things. Maybe we can knock out that cyclotron machine at Michigan State and get some more high tech in there. Because he writes in, can we clone offensive linemen? Can we use hockey players? Can obese fans like myself just be planted on the line and take damage for the team? I'm sure you have eligibility left. It's not, you know, it's not a bad idea to maybe call the NCAA and see if you can get on the field for a, a series or two. But anyway, I... I do want to point this out about the offensive line. I just want to shine a light on Brandon Baldwin, who was a tackle his whole career. And for the first time ever, started at right guard and played pretty much the entire game there, too. I thought he played pretty solid, only allowed one pressure on 40 snaps. I'm sorry, 40 pass plays. That is just one pressure on Child. So, yeah, you're asking a guy to do a lot for moving from the outside to the inside. It's different footwork. We had a big conversation about this with Tyler Higby in the offseason. Like, it, it is just not as easy as, oh, just... Slide one over and you're just going to do fine there, young man. Like that, that's a daunting task, but when I mean, you've already had two right guards out for the season, that's uh, that's a number you got to call. Also, of course, that means Stan Ramble. He's playing a lot of left tackle and just what a strong season for him. Redshirt freshman, knee injury last season. You know, he's more than holding his own so far this year. But to the negative part, uh, we already barked the, these two stats out. Three and a half yards between the tackles per run. Like it's it's good, not great, but the more alarming thing is, yeah, 4.3 yards per carry, 4.7 yards after contact. That's a lot of hits behind the line of scrimmage, guys. Like, that's just that's just not going to be a sustainable way to win football games. So, all right, South Roll, he writes in. Now, this isn't even a question. This is just a good vibe checker to end this episode on. Before we get into basketball talk here in a little bit, he writes in. I enjoy the content. Thanks. Just a nice compliment at the top there. I'm a bit older than your average listener, so I have some context on where we are right now in moving forward. The BC loss hurt, but the big picture is a plus. Everyone knew we had many chances to win this game despite injuries on the road, et cetera, et cetera. We are in a great place right now and moving forward. We all said it during the offseason. It's going to be a year of growing and learning and low expectations. And then we see the flashes and childs, Nick Marsh popping off, solid defense, and we throw it out the window and start talking seven-plus wins. That's not the way it works. It's going to be painful. But I'm seeing things such as offensive and defensive schemes that I've never seen in 30-plus years of following Spartan ball. The mindset and culture has changed, thankfully. We're going to be back and regular playoff contenders in 2026 and moving beyond as long as Smith is at the helm. I agree with it all. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think that also that you're not wrong with, you know, Childs showing those flashes, Nick Marsh popping off the defense, looking really solid that maybe expectations start to change here. So. Thanks a lot for the email. Let's get into basketball right now. Just a quick little note on recruiting on Wednesday. Five-star J- uh, Jalen Harrelson. He's a five-star, six-foot-seven ween out of La Lu. He will be picking his college. He's between Michigan State, Indiana, Notre Dame. 
Don't have a ton of intel on this that a lot of other people don't. It is as good of a guess as anyone. I personally just have a gut feeling that I'd be pretty shocked to see him pick Michigan State. And look, we're going to have Justin Thin on later this week. Like, we're going to talk football, of course, but I do want to talk about basketball recruiting because I, I've i got an opinion on basketball recruiting right now that I think is going to upset some people, and I need someone to put me in place. I need someone to uh, you know, maybe just break check me for a little bit, and Justin Thin's going to be maybe doing a really good job at that. Or maybe he'll agree, but – just to spoil it a little bit, I, I know that Michigan State is going big fish hunting or big game hunting in, on the recruiting trail for this cycle, the 2025 cycle. I think that there's a lot of very, very, very tough battles ahead, whether it's you're going up against established programs like UConn, like Duke, like Kansas. And guys, um, I, inconvenient truth here, Michigan State hasn't been that great the last five years. And also, well, not only are you going against established uh, programs, you're going up against some pretty good NIL giants too. Like guys that aren't afraid to spend a lot of money in NIL like your, well, Indiana's that we just named, of course, your Dukes of the world. So we'll see if I'm wrong on this. I, I would like to elaborate more on that with Justin Thin, but yeah, Harrelson committing somewhere Wednesday. Just, I, I don't think it'll be Michigan state. I would be thrilled to be wrong about this one. I would love for everyone to come back and dunk on me for that one, but yeah, we'll, we'll see. So we're within 24 hours of that decision. It looks like, all right. Now this news is a few days old. So I apologize for getting to this so late. It's just football dominates everything this time of year. The conference schedule came out for Michigan state basketball. We already knew the opponents. We already knew who we were going to play twice. It was Minnesota, Illinois, and Michigan are the teams you play twice, but we actually have hard dates now. So it's, it would be ridiculous for me just to list off all 20 games and all the dates. So I'm just going to pick out some stretches of games here to talk about, some notables here. So, again, the teams are playing twice. Minnesota, which, by the way, you open up uh, on the road right there. Uh, that's going to be December 4th. And then you play Illinois twice and Michigan twice. What's interesting about the Michigan thing, you don't see Michigan the whole season until February 21st. And that's going to be at their barn over in Ann Arbor. And then you end at home. Senior night at home against Michigan on March 9th. That's going to be electric. The last time senior night was against Michigan was during that COVID season where Aaron Henry and the Spartans went on that insane run to even make the tournament that year. But the last time they've done it with fans, face Michigan senior night at home. Well, that's 2019. That was also a magical run, too. You beat the Wolverines three times at the end of the season, both at their place, Breslin Center, to win the Big Ten Championship, and then, well, yeah, to win the Big Ten Tournament not too long after that. So I got to say, I you know what, just to talk about the rivalry for a little bit, uh, I don't know much about Dusty May. I'm going to be honest. It's like, you know, a person and how he carries himself. I hope he's hateable. Like, that's just the one thing I really didn't like about John Beeline. It's like, oh, he's that's a man of respect, and you could like him off the court. And it's like, yeah, that's all true. And that's why I hated him. Like, I, 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 I want the coach of my rival team to have an incredibly punchable face and to just be someone that I absolutely despise. And Juwan Howard, I, he did a fantastic job at that, I got to say. So I, I do miss Juwan, not just because he was burning Michigan's program to the ground the last few years, but, oh, man, just uh, what he, what he would do. And boil your blood. That's how you should feel as a rival fan. That was great. Uh, I'm always going to miss him trying to play defense on Cassius Winston back in the day. That was good. Um, anyway, speaking of it, about Michigan, who I think will be a solid team, which does bring me to the next point. What a weird Big Ten season we have coming up because everyone is going to be solid, it seems like. I don't think anyone's going to be extraordinary in the Big Ten. I don't think anyone's going to be a basement dweller in the Big Ten. We're going to go over to BartTorvik.com, and if you play the Locked on Spartans drinking game, go ahead and finish your beer because, yes, I brought up Bart Torvik yet again, but, guys, that's like the uh, predictive uh, stats out there. They've got the whole rundown for what they predict the season ahead lies in the Big Ten. BartTorvik.com has every Big Ten team between 12-8 and eight and 8-12 eight and 12 as things stand right now. That is crazy. You could throw a blanket over that field. Right now it's Purdue, Rutgers, Illinois, and your Michigan State Spartans. Sitting at the top, 12-8 and eight is their uh, assumed record. Indiana, UCLA, they're right behind at 9, sorry, 11 and 9. And then there are nine teams, nine teams projected to go 10 and 10. Michigan, Ohio State, Wisconsin, Maryland, Oregon, Iowa, Nebraska, Northwestern, USC. And then I guess you could call this the basement. 8 and 12, I, Minnesota, Washington, and Penn State. So I, with all that said, where is the gauntlet on this schedule? I got to go with this one here. There is a stretch in February where it's at Illinois, home against Purdue, and at Michigan. That is three games in six days, two on the road, and not just on the road, but during the weekend. 
And I know that might sound silly, you know, that we're splitting hairs over days of the week, but those weekend games, especially on the road, they get a little more juice than you do on like a sleepy Tuesday night, for example. So yes, you're playing at Illinois and at Michigan, both on weekends with a home game against Purdue sandwich in the middle of that. Now, where is the nice patch? I, Again, all these teams are going to be solid. There are no walkovers here. It's hard to find games that, you know, you really feel happy about. But what if we just blew it up into the first seven games of the season that you feel a little happy about, I guess? I mean, again, I, I'm not saying you're going to go 6-1 and one in this stretch, maybe even not 5-2, and two, but at Minnesota, home against Nebraska, okay? And then you get your little non-con games in the middle of that. Then you pick back up to start the new year at Ohio State, against Washington, at Northwestern, Penn State. So at Minnesota, at Northwestern, those aren't the two toughest road environments. I know that it didn't go well last year in Minnesota, but at Ohio State, that's going to be a really strong team. I think you get out of that. You could get out of there five and two, maybe four and three. But yeah, that's your like your realistic, you know, best shot of going five and two in any stretch of any seven games. So I gotta say, I, not a lot of uh, great spots in the schedule. It just could be a lot worse here. Other quick notes about the schedule I wanted to point out. The Rutgers game on the road is not going to be at the rack in Piscataway. It's going to be at Madison Square Garden. And I, a few Rutgers fans I saw on Twitter were a little upset. They're like, oh, Izzo refuses to play at the rack. Like, I, I actually think he would prefer to play at the rack. I'm pretty sure that's a Big Ten or a Rutgers decision, not a Michigan State decision where Rutgers plays their home games. Maybe I'm misinformed. But when I'm telling you that Izzo would probably rather play at the rack, that's both for, well, he likes to play in tough environments to, you know, really forge his team. But also this. MSU, 4-2 and two at the rack. Michigan State at Madison Square Garden, 4-16. and 16. That is a house of whores over there in New York City. Uh, I don't like to watch Michigan State play at Madison Square Garden. I'm sure at this point, Tom Izzo doesn't like to even go to Madison Square Garden. So, yeah, for all the Scarlet Knight fans that were up in arms, like, oh, he's dodging us. Like, I'm sure he would love to go to Piscataway and play there instead of Madison Square Garden, Michigan State's little house of horrors. Uh, anyway, early February swing uh, is, uh, sorry, early in February is the California swing, Saturday, February 1st at USC. And then a few days later, Tuesday, February 4th at UCLA, they'll probably stay at Magic Johnson's uh, mansion over there between games. All right, guys. We will be back. Okay, thanks a lot for your patience and getting to this episode. Really do appreciate all you guys. We're going to be back tomorrow. Chase Glasser of Spartans Illustrated. Then we're going to have a collab with Locked On Buckeyes. And then to end the week, Justin Thin, Locked On Spartans. You know where to keep it tuned. Love you all. Go green.